Well, hello there, and welcome to this week's painting video. I'd like to personally invite you into my studio, Yupari's Art Studio. And in this week's painting video, we are going to add a second layer onto the painting that we started last week. And we're going to be starting off with a greenish glaze. So this painting has had about a week to dry, and we're going over it with a greenish glaze using a combination of materials that I'll talk about in a little bit. And remember that this painting is being developed completely from the live model. I am painting a portrait of my fiance completely from life. And if you're wondering what colors I'm using for this greenish glaze, Terravert green and raw umber. I use Terravert green, raw umber, a little bit of Venetian medium uh, by Rublev, and some spike lavender oil to put in the greenish glaze. And now we are working opaque over top of the greenish glaze using uh, approximately size four, or should I say about exactly a size four bristle brush, silver bristle brush. Uh, this is the Grand Prix edition. And the skin colors are being painted opaque over top of the greenish glaze and the greenish glaze is being used as a base to paint over top of now not painting completely opaque throughout but a little bit of a transparency here and there this is something that I've been introducing to my online students as well is the um, the ability to be able to work over top of a darker glaze so the purpose of the glaze was not to use for a final uh, skin tone because then why would I use green and raw umber? That wouldn't make sense, right? So I'm going over top of it with brighter, more opaque colors, a little bit of uh, transparent mummy and cadmium red deep. Old Holland goes into the pinkish colors, but for the most part, it's mainly burnt sienna that's going into the mixtures. And like I said before, uh, or I wrote in the little box there, um, the colors will be listed for you in the description box. So again, using the Filbert bristle brush, uh, in particular a bristle brush, I'm able to cake on a lot more paint. And so I'm developing this um, Alla Prima start. So this painting was started in Alla Prima last week. And basically we get to go over it again in Alla Prima. I must reiterate that you can work any method that you want. You can use classical approach, you can use a la prima approach, you can use a mix between the two, uh, you can use any approach. And I usually say all approaches meet somewhere in the middle, and that is the middle stages in the painting. And as you're seeing here, I've completely planed out the uh, eye socket, uh, the bottom structure of the mouth, the uh, orbicularis area, orbicularis oris right beneath the mouth or the shape containing the mouth. And you're seeing uh, a lot of the green has been covered. The purpose of the green um, is really about pushing back the values that we had before, adding a layer of uh, medium so that we can mix the medium with the opaque paint right away. Uh, it's not the same as oiling out a painting by any means. It is similar in, in context but it's different in that we went over it opaque and now with a different brush I'm going and adjusting the shadow shape actually. So when you're working from life your paintings are going to be uh, an accumulation of many moments and that's different than working from the photo reference. The photo reference is quite limited in that it's one second or millisecond or whatever in time captured pretty much frozen. Uh, when you're working from life there's going to be changes and in particular uh, this week the background changed. Uh, we decided to put a dark greenish tone in the background. Different changes in the model's position led to different uh, should I say expressions, as you're seeing the camera zoom in and out, zooming in and out again. The, uh, the different little micro expressions can be captured more easily when you're painting from life than if you're painting from a photograph because you don't have micro expressions, little tiny expressions. Uh, if you'll notice from last week to this week, her expression actually changes in the painting. 
And so that's another aspect that you can capture, another aspect that you can portray. And there I am actually, when, when I use the brush like that, I'm actually trying to correct the pose. So you're actually seeing me trying to correct the pose, but there's always going to be little changes and shifts. But like I was saying, the micro expressions in the portrait painting, in particular, on the second pose, uh, on the second pose, uh, I, I believe I'm going to have another two sittings on uh, for this painting before I can call this painting complete. Uh, it's excellent because you return to a painting uh, that you're creating. Let's uh, make sure it's a portrait painting that we're talking about um, because otherwise this conversation might not make sense. Uh, but we're returning to the painting and we get to work over top of and build onto something that was... Um, you know, structurally understood, something that had a, a feeling of life to it, not static by any means, and get to uh, re-experience those moments yet again and put a much more, um, I want to say, put a much more, a, a much greater sense of the model's character, if that makes any sense. So a lot of times when you're painting a portrait from a picture, you know, it's really hard to capture the model's sense of character anyone as nelson shanks would say um anyone that's been deprived of a sense of character in a painting has been greatly diminished so when you're painting a portrait of someone from life from nature it's really one of the greatest experiences to return to the painting um you know day in day out however many times it takes to complete the painting and you're seeing you know these layers of structure start to build and you're seeing that even though it's the second sitting on this painting, it's the second week on this painting, we're still going in with big brush strokes, still going in with large, simple planes, working complex planes to simple planes to even, you know, the most minute little changes in shapes within values. And as you're seeing, this is more of a general uh, presentation of the portrait painting process. This is not meant to be uh, an educational lesson by any means. This is giving you a glimpse into my studio every week, preferably, and you're seeing exactly the same process that I use when I create my own paintings off camera. In fact, most of the way you've seen me create paintings in the past three or four years, I think four years now, um, that I've been uploading videos to YouTube, you've been seeing kind of a shorthand version of how I produce paintings. Number one, I almost never like to work strictly from photographs. If I have to use a photograph for, um, you know, clothing or something or whatever, so be it. But for the face, for the hands, for all of the figurative uh, elements in the painting, working from nature is my preferred way to work. And uh, due to pandemic and all of that, of course, I highly recommend self-portraits. That's one of the lessons that I'm teaching my online students is how to create uh, self-portraits from a mirror. And also, uh, you know, if you have a loved one, a spouse, um, someone that can sit and pose for you, that's also excellent as well. So you're seeing now the opaque paint build. Aren't you seeing a very, very dramatic change in the coloring from the beginning of the painting uh, to where we're at now. Now about nine minutes in to this edited video, you're seeing the buildup of color and you're seeing that greenish tone in the background start to emerge. And um, you know, even the shadows are taking much more color and uh, there's really something to be said about layering opaque paint onto a dry painting that was painted rather thick. The goal is to, by the time this painting is complete, the goal is to have a pretty decent amount of layers of color on this oil prime linen canvas. Uh, and it's just as much about the three-dimensional aspects to the painting as it is the two-dimensional aspects being, you know, the way the painting is executed and uh, the way the painting is created and now you're seeing again just going right over top of the details uh, 
again the second week on this painting and I'm painting over the eyes uh, flattening them out remember those micro changes that I was talking about that's exactly what I'm chasing at the moment I allow myself some time to chase the pose uh, sometimes you don't want to chase the pose other times you do want to chase the pose and if you're wondering what I mean by chasing the pose that's something that really only can happen when you're working from life now chasing the pose just means that you're going from one micro expression or one expression to another based on your preference so she had her eyebrows a little bit more raised this time and her mouth a little bit more relaxed than in the first day so i chased it uh, i went painted over the eyes raised the eyebrows and adjusted that i also had some errors in my drawing on the side of her face so i had to add a little bit more width there so partially uh, correcting drawing mistakes and then partially uh, chasing the pose to try to seek out those micro expressions now the important thing to mention when it comes to layering a painting because we are talking about layering uh, oil paintings in this week's upload is that you know that you are previous layer will dry before your second layer or your subsequent layers uh, to that extent so and in essence I'm talking about see how I'm putting in a, a very nice plane change right next to the side of the face in essence what I mean is make sure that every subsequent layer that you add onto your painting uh, dries a little bit more slowly than the first layers that you apply even though i use venetian medium uh, which is fast drying medium in fact the oil paint actually dries faster if you leave it alone if you don't use uh, much medium and you of course uh, paint with a moderate amount of paint not bucket loads of paint it will dry actually faster so in the first layer no medium was used and in this layer only a little bit of medium was used to put on that greenish glaze actually most of it was diluted with the spike lavender and uh, to mention the fat of uh, concept there are always many questions involved in it and there you're seeing how i adjusted the eye you know be brave be bold uh, like i said this is the second uh, the second week and I repainted the structure of the eye as you're seeing it looks kind of sloppy at the moment but again when you're painting from life you're chasing those micro expressions and it's a lot of fun it's a fun difficult uh, thing to do now what I was saying with Fat of Lean is it, you don't have to think about it very formulaic uh, just know that you want to have your preliminary layers your first layers be the fastest to dry and your subsequent layers to be the slowest to dry or another way to look at it is if you give yourself a week in between your paintings very likely you'll be fine unless you're using um for unless you're painting in a freezing temperature using very 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 slow drying paints trust me you'll be fine if you allow at least a week uh, in between the layers of your oil paintings of course you can expedite the process but this is just a general solution for you and at this point I'm starting with her left eye see how I put a little bit more uh, information in for her left eye now Oftentimes I put information into the painting and I take it back out, put it back in, take it back out until I get into a certain sense of freshness. I have a certain sense of, um, I don't know what the word is, but uh, brushiness to the painting that I like. I don't want to just paint the eye, render it very carefully, fill in the outlines, and then call it a day. Um, I want the brush strokes to explore. I want the paint to flow 
onto the, uh, the surface of the canvas. Now we have her right eye has been uh, developed, just like her left eye. So you're seeing how I'm moving about the painting, chasing those micro expressions. At this point, I've settled onto a micro expression uh, with her eyebrows, or should I say just the expression of her eyebrows, her lips uh, eventually get move, uh, moved slightly higher up as I did have a, a little bit of a drawing error. And the goal with these up these uploads, excuse me, the goal with these uploads is to to give you give you the gist of how I'm creating these paintings. Uh, like I said, if you're interested in educational content uh, from me, please check out my online classes. Links are in the description. Uh, but for the most part, these uploads are going to be like this. These are going to be edited more. Uh, worked on from life. Again, the reason that the photo reference isn't in here is, like I said, uh, last week I'm trying to make a point of working uh, strictly from life. I'm not going to put a photo reference in there and make it something that it's not because this is interpreting uh, the beauty and the magnificence of what you see in nature, uh, interpreting it and creating a painting, something that's created through uh, the human heart, uh, human intellect and uh, years of experience put into uh, a final result. And you'll notice I actually go back and forth between correcting shapes on the painting. See, I have to add a little bit more width to the side of her face. And um, that width doesn't match up with the corner of the eye because of the distortion from her glasses. I had two choices. I could paint the eye without the distortion of the glasses and just forget the distortion of the glasses or paint it in. And so I decided to paint it in. So you see the distortion of the eyes with the glasses. Whenever you're painting a model with glasses, I would suggest to actually put the glasses in early on uh, as a sketch and then you eventually paint them out. As you see here, I painted them out, and then I'm going to go back in and paint the glasses right back in. Next time, I will very likely do the same thing. Go back into the main shapes of the face, trying to get the painting closer and closer and closer to the beauty and magnificence of what I'm observing in nature, but at the same time knowing that the glasses will very likely be painted out and then painted back in, paint it out, and then paint it back in. That's just the way uh, it, it goes. And I'm going back and forth between bristle brushes and synthetic brushes. The yellow brush that you're seeing is a synthetic brush. So when I switch to the synthetic brushes, it's because there's very likely soft edges that I want to paint in. The bristle brushes for me are excellent for piling on a lot of paint. Uh, hence why I used it in the beginning of this layer, and now why I'm using the synthetics closer towards the end of this layer. The synthetics just don't carry as much paint as the bristles, but you don't always want to carry tons of paint. Sometimes what you want is a very subtle, just a whisper of a shape onto, say, the side of the cheek, as you're seeing there, and then the hair being blended into the side of the face. Very soft, quiet moments is where I tend to use the uh, synthetic brushes. Now very often I get this question from my students uh, that are more accustomed to painting in Alla Prima. Um, you know, I, how do I get past the first layer in an Alla Prima painting? You know, I get this question a lot. Um, you know, people that are used to painting landscapes, just one sitting at a time, still lives one sitting at a time. How do I get past this point? And my answer is usually pretty simple. Just treat it like an Alla Prima all over again. Uh, just build onto what you've had before. Think about it as a building process, and it's not that bad. Um, the glaze really helps. The greenish glaze really helps uh, to, you know, 
reconnect with a painting after you haven't seen it for a week or so or haven't worked on it uh, for a week or so that greenish glaze definitely helps and the skin color the complexity of the color when you build over top of that greenish glaze is is something to take note of and again it was developed and built just like an ala prima painting but now it's an ala prima painting painted over an ala prima but not so much completely opaque in that you still see some of the first layer showing through, if that makes any sense. Uh, again, you have the first layer showing through in some areas, but you go over the entire thing with big, broad brush strokes in such a way that you know the layers are semi-opaque, but it's a building process in that you're working a la prima, over top of another ala prima and in that sense it is a layered approach that is kind of the amalgamation of you know subsequent ala prima paintings remember ala prima means painting wet on wet and now we're starting to key the lights so now that we've covered all of the tones on the face. A little bit more titanium white goes into the cheek right there. Titanium white transparent mummy. Uh, transparent mummy is a Roblev color. My titanium white is Old Holland brand. And so right into the lights, a little bit of lead tin yellow goes into the mix there. I noticed that uh, the skin tone that I, the combinations that I use for the skin tone for the most part uh, was uh, lead white number two, Rublev color, uh, transparent mummy, and lead tin yellow. Transparent mummy, Rublev, lead tin yellow, uh, lead tin yellow light um, from Michael Harding brand. Now, I want you to notice that at this point, one could say, I think I've finished the painting. It's close to being finished. And at this point, it's really where you go beyond uh, where you've been in a painting. And I don't suggest trying to do this from a photo reference, uh, I really don't, because when you're trying to level up, so to speak, when you're painting strictly from photographs, you're limiting yourself. Like I made this analogy, uh, I didn't make this analogy, somebody else did. Uh, it's like putting a cast on your leg and trying to run. It doesn't work. Uh, so when you're trying to push beyond where you've been in a painting, do it when you're working from nature. Next time I work on this painting, uh, next time I, the next time I work on this painting, I'm going to look at it with a fresh eye once again and continue to build and build and build and build until what I'm seeing on my canvas emulates uh, the beauty and magnificence of what I see from nature. And that's, again, going back to the main topic of this video, which is layering techniques. Layering can be very, very clinical, or it can be very, very spontaneous, fun, energetic, um, and I'm going for the latter, uh, for an energetic and spontaneous approach. Didn't I tell you that I would move the lips up? That's right. So again, don't get attached to the painting. Another very, very important thing to mention, do not get attached. Don't get precious with your paintings. If you have to move the lips up, move them up. I've explained it many times uh, in the past how I go about doing this, so I'm not going to tell you how I do it, but you're seeing that I am doing that. I'm lifting the lips up very, very slightly. Um, and while I do that, I can go in and adjust the edges once again. Like I said, when it comes to the main topic of this uh, video, we are layering an ala prima style painting over top of an ala prima style start having utilized the greenish glaze in the beginning and then very opaque and broad brush strokes to carry the paint through and take it to a further sense of refinement. But knowing that I'm going to give myself at least two more layers to continue to push this painting until it is as far as I can humanly push it. And like I said, it's a push and pull. So oftentimes, you know, I will be 
developing shapes on the face and then other times I'll be correcting shapes on the face so I had to move the mouth up and then I also had to adjust the angle of the mouth. Oftentimes I stand back and squint, look at the painting from a distance. Uh, other times I will look at the painting upside down. Other times I'll look at the painting uh, through a mirror to double the distance and to reflect the uh, image. So sometimes when I look at the paintings through a mirror it helps me see things like that. Um, so angles that need to be adjusted. And this has already reached a uh, scope far beyond my uh, paintings that I created during my public streaming days uh, when I was doing streaming, live streaming on YouTube. This kind of subtlety, this kind of uh, artwork would not be possible as a public stream. You know, I'd, I have to admit it, I wouldn't be able to do it just because my focus would not be in the painting, my focus would be on other things. So again, as you're seeing with these uploads, you're going to see closer, closer, and closer uh, how I actually want my paintings to ultimately look when they are you know framed in a gallery uh, if i'm lucky in a museum one day you know the finest work that i can possibly create again working a hundred percent from the live model and when you're painting with thick paint like that uh, you can really have the most advantages when it comes to softening edges blending edges so to speak just don't get into the habit of blending too much now uh, mixing up a color in between edges is really the best thing to do and then just lightly lightly blending it see the very light touch notice that my hand is not positioned right on the front of the brush even though I'm this far in the painting I'm still holding the brush at an arm's length uh, away or holding the brush at the end and keeping myself at an arm's length away and we're still keying the lights I use titanium white in the highlights and lead white in the middle tones now that the background has been filled in with uh, a dark greenish tone I'm now going to start to put in some details some information in for the uh, the coat uh, just for everyone's uh, just for future reference I will continue to adjust the uh, the uh, the poncho that the model is wearing it's a it's a poncho sweater mix kind of thing uh, but I will actually push back some of the details that you will see me put in this week so next week I'll very likely push back some of those details and put in a little bit more structure into these areas but for the time being uh, you're gonna see me paint a little bit more of the hair notice how the painting reads from a distance uh, and this is what you want you want the painting to read its best from a distance and then when you're close up to the painting, then you see all the individual brush strokes. But from the distance, you want the entire thing to, to work well as a unit. So we're adding a little bit more shape for the hair. Notice that the neck is a little bit uh, cooler in temperature than the, uh, than the face. The face is actually a little bit uh, more orangey pink as a whole. And we're using a little bit of the um, transparent mummy with cadmium, uh, cadmium red deep old Holland, um, and a touch of cobalt blue, cobalt blue Williamsburg, and then a little bit of bone black uh, Roblev for the darks of the um, that red, the red clothing that the model's wearing. And remember, the colors are listed in the description box.
Speaking of colors, I really do not prefer using a, a palette next to the painting. That's one of my least favorite places to have the palette. Uh, oftentimes I prefer to hold a palette, but for practicality's sake I've been using a glass palette for a little while now, uh, just so I can put the palette in the freezer after my painting sessions and preserve my paints. In the past I would just take the paints off of my wooden palette, put it in a box, and then put that in the freezer. I ended up becoming a little tired of that, and then I just ended up placing the colors on the glass palette and the glass palette in the freezer. Now you're seeing the details start to be added. And remember that the materials matter a lot. Um, I would not suggest doing this with uh, student grade colors. Um, if you want to work with moder water mixable oil paints, that's fine. Just give yourself about two to three weeks instead of one week, possibly even four weeks in between sittings for your painting to be dry enough to rework. Um, my suggestion is to look at the materials that I've, I'm using. Look at the materials in the description box if you would like to paint similar to what I'm doing. Or if you're more interested in my specific techniques, uh, please check out the online classes, in particular uh, the live stream tier, where you can see how I uh, create my instructional paintings uh, in, in terms of live lessons that I do twice a week now. Again, all of that is on um, in, the, in the description box information for that. And then we have the patterns on the, uh, on the clothing. And here's where it goes a little bit awry. Uh, I start to put some of the lights on the clothing and it just doesn't read. You'll see what I mean. It just doesn't quite read from the distance. So very likely uh, next week, I will push back the detail closer to where you're seeing the painting now. But like I said, give yourself time to experiment with the painting, uh, with your paintings. You're going to push information, you're going to add it, you're going to subtract it um, until you find what best suits your painting. But for me, um, looking at the painting and in hindsight afterwards, I really don't think that the light spots on the uh, clothing there did much for the painting. So I'm very likely going to push some of them out. Uh, on the next sitting with this painting. That being said, that's going to be about it for the second layer on this oil painting. I wish you the very best in all of your artwork. Remember, if you would like to see some of my instructional uh, courses, please check out my online classes on my Patreon. Again, I wish you the very best in all of your artwork, and I'll see you on the next one.